Hello, everyone. Um, let me just start by saying that in the time I have been organising these seminars, seems like forever, um, we've never had a speaker who has been requested by so many different people. Since Candice came back uh, to St Andrews um, from Edinburgh a couple of years back, I can't recall how many, but at least four or five people have said, when the earth are we going to get her to come again? Now, actually, the reason why it's taken so long is her fault, um, not, not mine. Um, she's in great demand, so it's very difficult uh, to find a date when she can be here. Perhaps that's why Good Friday is about the only date we could, we could make. But I really am delighted because Candace is extremely busy. Um, she, as, as I intimated, she started off here many, many years ago. Uh, you can tell me it was many, many years ago because there was a time where people like Dave Perrot had hair and were young. Um, uh, she was in zoology. She then moved to Edinburgh and stayed in Edinburgh and recently has come back here. In that time, I think uh, Candice has established herself as probably one of, if not the world's leading expert on uh, child and adolescent health and uh, well-being. In fact, she instituted a research group first in Edinburgh and then brought it, uh, brought it here wholesale. Um, she has also co coordinated um, a schools-based survey, Health Behaviour for School-Age Children, which uh, at last count, I think, was a 43-nation study organised by the WHO, of which she is coordinator. So, as I say, one of the leading uh, experts in that area. I also discovered, by judiciously looking at the web, that she has something in common with J.K. Rowling, and came across a beautiful photo of when you were declared a woman of influence in Scotland um, along with J.K. Rowling and uh, Nicola Bernadette and others who were privileged to be in your company. So uh, it really is a great pleasure and thank you all for making time to come and talk to us today. Thanks Steve for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I did second year psychology and Dave was actually in the same class as me. At that time had hair down to here and <laughs> sported a very beautiful Afghan coat. Um, so those were the days when we were all hippies. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here today and I've got a number of purposes with my talk. Um, I'm going to introduce you to this big international study and the wealth of data it has and describe one particular interest of mine which is social inequalities. But I'm also going to present some very new work that I've been doing, which is on my other big interest, which is pubertal development. So um, the puberty work really stems from my, my days as a, a student here when I did behavioural development in my fourth year in zoology. And I've kept this passion all this time. Um, but at that time I was studying fish and then I did my PhD on cat behaviour. And, and now I've reached um, working with young people. So um, the, far, the first part of the, the talk will be really to introduce you to um, HBSC. And I have a, a reason for doing this because I, I do want to encourage um, members of the department who are interested to come and work with us. We have a lot of data and there might be something in it that piques your interest. Um, so I'm going to take you on a journey which will explore the potential of this data to understand social and cultural de determinants of adolescent health across countries. Um, and then I'll present some examples of socioeconomic and gender inequalities. And then, as I said, this new work um, that we're really just in the middle of analysing at the moment. So it is very early days on social and cultural factors in pubertal development and particularly looking at paternal investment theory. So um, I'm going to try and keep to time and um, <clears throat> the first thing to say is if you want to get to know the data we recently published this report which is um, produced by WHO that partners the study and it really takes you through the main uh, areas that we cover in terms of topics. So we've brought a bundle of these um, and they'll be on, um, you can take them away from the, the reception afterwards. So please feel free to take a copy. Um, it's, it's like a resource that you could get a very good idea of the, the depth and breadth of the study. But the aim of this study, which started 30 years ago in three countries, it was very for, forward thinking because at that time the word impact hadn't actually been 
thought of, but from the beginning, HBSC, although primarily a scientific study, wanted to have an impact on policy and, and actually take this research and influence practice uh, around young people's health. So primarily it was a scientific study, but um, they partnered with WHO very quickly and that became another main aim of the study. It also is a study which, which nurtures um, collaboration and the network is now probably close to 400 researchers from 43 countries. And this is a, an active network. We work together all the time. We meet twice a year and um, we produce all our research together. So it's, it's not a centralised um, study where, where a couple of people decide on the research protocol and everyone else follows it. Um, and also we aim to be a, a source of information and we work very closely with, um, sorry, I jumped ahead there. We work very closely with uh, also UNICEF, the OECD, the European Commission and other large NGOs and agencies. So the data is collected every four years. We're actually in the field right now. Data field work goes, uh, sorry, survey field work goes from autumn through to spring in all countries and Scotland does their field work in the spring. So we're currently trying to collect data. Um, trying being the operative word because Scotland is now flooded with surveys of school children and it's actually quite difficult to get schools to agree to this work. Um, so we've, be, we've been quite concerned about this issue, uh, particularly this time. The sample size is, is pretty good, it's 1500 for each age group, 11, 13 and 15 and I mentioned the standardised protocol which is using a validated instrument for the survey. And in total, in 2009-10, we surveyed over 200,000 young people on a wide range of topics. Um, I'm sure there's something in this list that would be interesting to you. So that the unique aspect of HBSC is that it looks at young people's health within social context. So it's not purely a surveillance or monitoring study, but it looks at different, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong thing. It looks at different aspects of the family, peers, school environment and pubertal development. And for psychologists, I think there's a, there's a whole load of areas that would be of interest potentially. Um, I'm very interested in uh, social inequalities, but we, we don't know that much about why and how the affluence or deprivation circumstances in your family affect your um, well-being and your behaviour. But we find very consistent patterns, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and I think this is the area where we need a lot more work, really understanding the cultural influences, and I'll touch on that later. So why, is it, why does a, a government, a Scottish government, fund HBSC? So HBSC has been funded in Scotland for over 20 years. And I think the reasons are they find it useful for benchmarking. They find out what are the things about Scotland that make it stand out. And what are the problems are common to all countries? And what, what does that tell us about how we might address some of these problems? So what can we borrow from other countries that have been more successful? Or how can we explain? And so we've seen 20-year um, trends in Scotland and uh, in virtually every country there's been a, a steady and steep decline in substance use, for example. Um, for the first time in 20 years, girls' smoking is now the same as boys. It's been always higher. Um, and so we can also look at developmental trajectories and find out what are the key moments we should intervene to prevent um, risk behaviour. So looking at these maps that are produced, we can see um, some very consistent patterns. So here we see that in every single country, girls are less likely to be physically active than boys. And this means that there's something more than just the the environmental constraints that are present in Scotland that are stopping young women being active. So this is a very significantly gendered behaviour. Um, similarly with weight reduction behaviour, exactly the opposite picture with every single country. I mean, boys really barely indulge in this habit, 
but in every country you can see that rates are between 20 and 30 percent and yet they, they are actually less likely to be overweight. <coughs> My big area of interest is socioeconomic inequalities and we see inequalities um, portrayed not only in the outcomes, not only in the behaviours, but also in the whole social context of young people's lives. So we use the family affluence scale, which is a common scale, and um, Norway has very few children who are qualified as low affluence or deprived, and Turkey at the other extreme has very few in the most affluent group. So this is a, a common metric that we can use across every country. And um, just to let you see how it works, if we look at a behaviour such as soft drink consumption, in Armenia, this is a behaviour of wealthy children. In Scotland, this is a behaviour of um, less affluent children. So you're more likely to consume sugary drinks if you're wealthy in Armenia. It's a, it's a luxury good almost. <coughs> But this is the difference in consumption rate among boys from um, the highest affluent group to the lowest. So that's the affluence gap. And in Scotland, it goes in the other direction. So in the slides that follow, you can see how big the, the inequalities are in any particular behaviour. So if we look at life satisfaction, in every single country except for Greenland and Iceland, or at least Greenland, Icelandic girls, those who are more affluent have significantly higher levels of life satisfaction. It's a completely consistent picture. But what's interesting is the, the effect is bigger among girls. So if you're a deprived, a girl from a deprived background, your life satisfaction is significantly lower than a girl from a more affluent, but also the gap is much bigger for girls. So this is a really important issue. And we see this um, pattern of differences in all sorts of aspects, self-rated health, health complaints, injuries in the opposite direction. So more affluent children are more likely to be injured, probably from sports injuries. And overweight and obesity is interesting because in wealthy countries, you're less likely to be overweight if you're wealthy. And the opposite is the case in poor countries. <clears throat> So again, in behaviours, so health behaviours, brush, brushing teeth more than once a day, we see these huge inequalities. Um, and this also is the case for fruit eating, breakfast eating, tooth brushing, and also again we see these gender interactions. But I mentioned that it also appears in context. So this is a, a measure of how young people think they're doing at school. And you can see that those who are more affluent think they're doing better. They may, may or may not be, but they believe that um, their, te their teachers perceive their performance as better. Um, so you can see that the advantage not only is demonstrated in the outcomes, but is also demonstrated in the contextual environment. So it also um, shows up in how you get on with your parents, the number of friends you have, the amount of electronic media contact you have, and so on. So just talking now a little bit about gender, um, I'm, a, I'm actually in a, a special focus group on gender, and we realised quite quickly that um, we really don't know how to, how to talk about or how to think about gender differences. What do they mean, and what, what does being equal on a health-related outcome mean? Is that something that's desirable? It depends on the rate that this um, behaviour or health outcome is, is seen. So um, in the case of uh, overweight, it's pretty obvious we all would rather have a normal BMI, but, be, but overweight is actually more common among boys, even though body image would go the opposite direction, uh, as does weight control behaviour. Um, boys tend not to worry about their weight very much at all, uh, which is probably explains the higher rate of obesity in men as well. And, um, but for any perceived health outcome, we find worse, a worse picture for girls. So multiple health complaints, that's headaches, feeling low, not being able to sleep, um, stomachache and so on. Much higher rates of expression of complaints among girls. 
And if we, if we look at the sort of overall picture, we find that girls tend to do better on not performing risk behaviours, so they have a better risk profile. But on um, mental health and any aspects of well-being, they are doing much less well than boys. Interestingly, electronic media communication has climbed rapidly in the last few years, and girls are, are much more likely to interact with their friends in this way. Um, and we know that this has both a positive dimension and a negative dimension. And we're now trying to develop some good questions around this area because it's, it's, it's a tricky area to survey because the, the, the field is, the, the context is moving so quickly. Um, so we're trying to understand. There, there's some, some new work in the US which talks about problematic internet use. And it's thought to be the, the earliest addiction that children show. So we're trying to tap into that. But our data is a bit out of date at the moment in, in that respect. So we also have this new phenomenon of gender equalization. And what's happened here is that in some countries, we see girls adopting male patterns of risk. So smoking behavior, drinking behavior, sexual behavior. But we haven't seen, so if you like, girls are becoming more like boys in their risk behavior. But they're not becoming more like boys in their mental health. So that they're actually now in a worse health state because um, we're not seeing any more positive aspects from that gender equalization process. So obviously this is quite a complex consumer driven process to some extent. So here you see that in, in the UK um, girls and boys patterns of drinking are very similar. In fact girls are more likely to um, report drunkenness than, than boys in, in Scotland and in Wales. And there's a few other countries, uh, Finland and Denmark, where there's this gender equalization. And we, we, we understand rather little about it at the moment. Um, I just want to whisk through the age changes. The, the reason I mention these is that adolescence is actually quite a neglected area in public health. The, the prevailing view is that they're healthy. We don't need to worry about them. They're not dying. But actually, over this relatively short period, virtually all the health indicators we look at worsen quite dramatically. So between early and mid-adolescence, um, there's really significant changes happening. So this is just the way that um, the percentage of children who rate their health as only poor or fair, or fair. And you can see there's really quite a big difference over this relatively short period. Um, so I now want to um, just finish up that section of my talk So by, by saying that there's been a great effort among the um, researchers in, in my field in adolescent health to try and get adolescents on the agenda. And this, is, this has manifested itself in a number of ways. This, the Lancet has published two series on adolescent health. Um, to try and sort of become equivalent to the focus that there has been on the early years. But also there's really interesting new um, brain research going on showing that um, the adolescent brain is actually changing dramatically and in very interesting ways that might explain uh, some of the risk patterns we're seeing. So I think there's, there's starting to be a bit of a shift of interest and recognition that really there is no other period in the life course where there's so many changes happening all at once and it makes it a, a critical time for positive inputs if we are to to keep um, young people's health on a positive track. So um, I actually want to now move on to this new work um, because I think it might be of particular interest to some of you but also you may have some ideas on how to interpret uh, our findings. So, as I mentioned, this has been another uh, prevailing interest of mine. And we, we did an analysis um, last year looking at the role of obesity um, in, in menarche and found that the differences in levels of obesity across our countries explained a lot of the variance in the differences in age of menarche. And there are physiological explanations for that. Um, 
But it's an interesting topic because early, man early menarche is actually a very important risk factor for health um, and behaviour in all sorts of dimensions, behavioural outcomes, psychological outcomes, physical outcomes during adolescence. But also, it's a risk factor for reproductive cancers, for, um, for also social outcomes, for um, how well you do as an individual in your life um, can be tracked back to pubertal um, timing. It's also, menarche is a very robust measure. It's a valid measure for saying, you know, this is the stage that puberty has reached. It's a late marker of puberty. So why is this interesting to look at in cross-national data? Well, we see very large differences in timing of menarche, the equivalent of about 60 years of secular change. So over the last 60 years in the US, um, the age at menarche has dropped by a year and so we're seeing differences of a year across Europe, which is massive. Um, I think this illustrates that monarchal timing is highly susceptible to environmental influences. And by looking at the differences, we can actually start to query what are the social and cultural factors in explaining pubertal timing. So this is a chart from actually the previous survey, 2005-06, showing the, the range of age of menarche across our country. So in Italy, um, the average age of menarche, the median age was 12, point f 12 years, five months, whereas in um, Latvia, it's 13 years, six months. So it's all, just over a year's difference. You'll notice a clustering of Eastern European countries here, Russia, Estonia, Macedonia, and this relates at least in part, to thinness. So these, these girls are thin girls compared to girls at this end. So we found a very strong relationship with obesity, as I mentioned. Um, so this is the um, work we're doing now, looking at the biological, social and cultural mechanisms underlying paternal investment as a risk factor for early menarche. So um, why did we look at this? Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting evidence around the, um, the impact of the social environment within which girls are growing up that contributes to early menarche and then in itself how early menarche, sorry, how early menarche changes the social context of the next stage of adolescence. So if you have early menarche, this completely changes your social networks and your social behaviour and risk behaviour. So what sort of factors have been at play? The literature um, has found that most of these factors are related to stressors within the family as a sort of overarching framework. So family conflict, divorce, absence of a biological father, presence of a stepfather and also maternal effects have all been implicated in timing. Um, so here's a couple of studies, one in New Zealand and one in the US, looking at um, family conflict. Um, and this one shows the experience of family conflict at age seven, predicts the age of menarche. Uh, this paper also looked at family stress, and counted for 20% of the variance in menarche. Would you the, the direction of these effects? Yes, these are longitudinal, so they've got early data and then they can look forward. Yeah, no. Yes, yeah, that's the, that's the hypothesis. And then there's been a lot of work on father absence and um, a very interesting new study just published by Culpin et al. using the, the large um, birth cohort study, the, the Avon Longitudinal Study, which um, was instigated in Bristol in 1990. And they looked at this large birth cohort of over 5,000 girls and they found strong evidence for an association between father absence, particularly in the first five years of life, um, and also between five and 10, but stronger in this period. Um, so the, the hypothesis behind this is that um, paternal investment actually is detectable by girls. So the notion is that they can detect and encode the information about a lack or, or poor quality care or investment from a father and that this calibrates the neurophysiological 
systems of the of the young person um, and affects the timing of menarche so it affects all the hormonal systems and also they think the motivational systems linked to sexual behavior so some of the correlations have been with sexual onset sexual behavior onset so what is this notion um, basically from an evolutionary point of view paternal investment um, will vary as in a, a function of the extent to which um, it, it will enhance the offspring, offspring fitness, trade off against the mating opportunities of the, the father and being certain of the paternity of the offspring. So um, in this case, the um, Culpin study wanted to also look at whether paternal absence was was just a, another stress, whether it operated through, they also looked at maternal depression and the family being in major um, financial problems, but they found an independent uh, pathway in their model that linked father absence to monarchical timing. So this is quite strong evidence that there's a, a physiological process going on and they, this is the, the pathway that they um, hypothesize. So what about stepfathers? There's also a body of literature that says it's, it's more of a stepfather effect or there's an, also a stepfather effect. And th the theory here is that the presence of a stepfather would be a cue to daughters that paternal investment is, is unreliable or it's unimportant or that it's deemed unimportant. Um, father has left and there's now a strange male. And this also increases the risk of neglect and abuse. So a couple of studies have looked for this, and one um, here, Ellison Garber, have found a stepfather effect. This is quite a small study, but this very large study, a uh, retrospective study of 10,000 adult women, um, could find no stepfather effect. So now um, we've done some analysis of our 2009-10 data. So I'm working with um, my colleague Juliet McEachran on this. And this is really still underway, but I, I did want to share it with you because I think it's quite exciting and I'd be interested to get your perspectives. So we were able to look at 18 countries. Now, the reason we couldn't look at all the countries was, as I mentioned earlier, there are many countries where there are two parents is the norm, like 98% of children live in a two-parent family. Um, so this is mainly in Eastern Europe where it's very, still very traditional. Um, so we had to have at least, you know, a decent percentage, more than a sort of 15% that um, were not living with two, two parents. We, sat, we carried out separate analyses for each country and we only looked at girl, girls who had um, menstruated within the last three years. And this was so that the data we collected on the family environment was pertinent to that event. Obviously, this is not ideal. We don't have early childhood data. Um, and this is some of the statistical procedures that were used to look at um, multiple factors. So we looked at whether or not you lived with a stepfather, whether you lived with two or two biological parents. And we also have a question about where children spend their time. So that if they have more than one home, how much time do you spend in each home? So this would be for a split up family. Um, <clears throat> and um, whether the father lives with the child in their main home. And then we also introduced two other measures, which were really to be the closest thing we had to family conflict. So it's ease of talking to your parents or difficulty in talking to your parents about things that bother you. So it's, it's a bit of a, a loose measure, but it, it seems to, to operate. So this is just a table showing you where we found some effects. So where there's a, a, a dark box, it means we found an effect. So there's only one country, Switzerland, where we found a protective effect of living with two biological um, parents. We had three countries. I'm going to go into more detail in a minute, but just to explain this slide. So three countries where there was a stepfather effect. There was only one country, Scotland, where living with your father all the time made a protective effect um, uh, and also yes yeah, so this is the father lived in your main home and he was there all the time you know both there all the time 
and then communication with father and communication with mother. So what we found was that in three countries, Canada, Iceland and the USA, living with a stepfather was associated with earlier age at menarche. And these were the three countries that had the very highest rates of stepfatherhood. Um, so the average is 8.8% and um, USA is nearly 16%, so it's almost double that. So There's a very, very high rate of stepfathers. So that may be partly explaining that effect. Um, we had no clear evidence of a father absence effect, but we did find a father presence effect. Um, I mentioned that this was Scotland, but also in French-speaking Belgium, we found the same, and Switzerland, living with the two biological uh, parents. And then we looked at this ease of talking, and we found that this was pretty important. So when we just did a simple bivariate analysis, we found that 10 out of 18 countries where girls had difficulty talking to their father, they were at risk of earlier menarche. Um, but when we introduced ease of speaking to mother, that knocked out four of the countries. And we found a father-only effect in five countries and a mother-only effect in Denmark. So when, um, when all the other factors are taken into account, we had four countries that um, we found an conflict or the opposite of conflict effect. And just to show you how much of a difference this made, so if you look at um, children who find it very difficult to speak to their father, and this is in Iceland, their average age at Menarche is 13 years and three months. So it's a three month difference, which this is very easy, which you might think, well, that's nothing, but actually that's you know, 10 or 12 or 15 years of secular change. It's, it's, a, it's a biologically meaningful difference. Um, and similarly with um, France, uh, 13 years compared to 13 years, four months. And then with mother, um, we actually found the same effect, which was very interesting. So this, this really kind of pulls in another theory about maternal investment, and we're not at all sure about that. So um, difference between 12 years, 11 months, and 13 years, three months. So, and a five month difference here. So it's pretty interesting. I'm not sure exactly what it means. So to conclude from that, in some but not all countries, family context factors are associated. But the nature of these associations vary and include father absence or presence, stepfather presence, ease of talking to father and mother. And so it's likely that these associations depend on the types of family arrangement and family culture that prevail in different countries. And that could be you know, prevalence of family dissolution as a cultural norm, remarriage, time sharing between family homes. I mean, we know that when, when we included this question on do you have a second home, there was about 10 countries that just had no idea why we were asking that. They said, what do you mean? Do you mean a summer house or a holiday home? You know, nobody lives in two homes. I mean, it's a completely foreign idea in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And yet it's, it's very, very common now in the US and the UK and Northern, Northern Europe. So what about the wider evidence? How does this fit into it? Well, obviously, we're, we're building on the existing research that the family environment is important in developmental trajectories which have implications for health. We found mixed evidence on protective and risk effects on paternal investment and different indicators being important. We think also, you know, the study design, our study design is a very crude instrument to look at this sort of developmental um, process and yet we're finding these effects so I think there must be something very strong going on here. We don't really understand the cultural context but we, we have had some thoughts about this and we think it may be due to not only culture, tradition, but also the way that the state looks after families. So in, in Mediterranean countries there's very little um, state help for the family. In, in countries like Denmark, there's a lot. You know, the, in Sweden, the, the child is the center of, of national policy for support. So you will not suffer as a child if your family breaks up. There's, there's good child support. And so what are the expectations of parents in a country where the state will care? 
So we think we need to dig a bit deeper and try and classify our countries in terms of the, the culture and support for a family that allows fathers and mothers to be more or less bothered and investing in their children. You know, if somebody else will do it, um, if, they, if they will not fall by the wayside if the state takes care. And if, and if also, you know, there's a culture where fathers are not expected to take that much interest versus take a lot of interest in their children, then um, there could be very different outcomes. So, I mean, being quite critical, you know, what are the, what is the potential and limitations of this sort of data? And, you know, honestly, um, it, it kind of leads you into very interesting questions. You, know, you can look at these differences between countries and it, it is an entry point for hypothesis development and analysis. But, you know, cross-sectional data has limitations when you're looking at developmental issues and you can't get away from that. So, um, Ross uh, Whitehead, myself and another colleague, Sylvia Paracini in, in medicine are now um, requesting some longitudinal data from ALSPAC to, to try and look at some of these processes from a longitudinal perspective and also um, trying to bring together genetic and um, social questions. So, um, also just from a more of a policy perspective, this international benchmarking is a useful device for identifying issues for countries. And because it's a repeated cross-sectional study, not a longitudinal study, you can actually use it to track secular change and the impact of policy events or um, financial events. We're now looking at the impact of the recession on well-being, as I mentioned. And we can also look at the introduction of smoking legislation and so on. But I think that what, um, at a very simplistic level, what cross-national comparisons tell us is that the health of young people is highly malleable uh, to social and cultural environments. And so this gives us a handle that we can do something to improve uh, health outcomes. So, um, I hope I've entertained you for a sufficient period of time. Um, I'd like you to feel that you could get in, in contact if there's any aspect of this work that interests you and um, if you'd like to work with some of our data. You know, we, we'd, be very help, we'd be very happy to introduce you to it and, um, and uh, let you get to know it. Um, so we also have a couple of websites that you can just have a look at. We're, we, this is relevant. We're a new collaborating centre on health policy for young people and um, this is really to try and take the work not just from this study but also other colleagues in medicine, uh, Peter Donnelly and uh, Jerry Humphreys who you all know and really say you know how can we translate this research into something useful for policy and we have our inaugural event next week on Thursday which you're very welcome to attend on violence and young people. Okay thank you very much. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. This, indeed, in many ways, has been a good Friday. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.